Este es un contenido de Uninorte Académico. Suscríbete, aprende y comparte. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at Catedra Europa, the 25th version here at Uninorte, um, to a talk that's called Digitalization and Entrepreneurship, the Road to Recovery. We're welcoming to this talk Erko Autio, who's currently the chair in technology venturing and entrepreneurship at Imperial College London Business School. Erko was a founding member of the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, GEM, initiative and the world's largest ongoing research consortium in social science that has been running since 1997 uh, and of which global network um, Universidad del Norte um, is part of. He is a co-founder of the Global Entrepreneurship and Development Institute and co-author of the Global Entrepreneurship Index. He is also a member of the Wicked Acceleration Lab, a joint initiative between the Imperial College of Business School and Royal College of Arts that develops methods for Wicked Acceleration, Deep Tech Acceleration and Moonshot Acceleration. He served at the Senate of Imperial College and in the Research Committee of ICBS. His work has been cited over 47,000 times. We also welcome Alejandro Name, who is alumni of the Business Administration Program at Universidad del Norte. He has obtained an MBA from Fundemes, Fundesem Business School in Spain and is co-owner and chief uh, commercial officer of Liquitech. Prior to co-funding Liquitech, he has gained extensive experience in the financial sector. Liquitech, uh, a fintech company that was founded in Barranquilla, offers financial solutions to companies in Colombia promoting financial inclusion. It has been highlighted by both El Portafolio and Forbes as a promising company to solve some of, the, some of the problems related to financial inclusion of SMEs in Colombia and Latin America. Thank you very much to both of you uh, for joining us here today, and thank you to the audience for joining us. You can ask questions at the end of the presentation. Erko, please. Uh, thank you, Jana. It's great to be here, and good morning, everyone. Um, right, so let's get started. Um, I'll just set up my clock here. Um, so I've been told that I should be talking roughly 60 minutes, which sounds like a lot to listen to me. So unlike Jana said, if you do have questions, please interrupt so it doesn't become too monotonous. Um, yeah, again, great to be here and let's get straight into it. So I like to show this slide first. No, let me ask first. How many of you and I'm asking the students here because faculty is kind of lost course already. How many of you would like to start a new business, become an entrepreneur? We have some. That's good. And how many of you would prefer to go work for someone else? And I suppose the rest prefer to do nothing. So, you know, that's great. OK, good. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is mostly it's going to be digital entrepreneurship. And I'm going to um, try to convince you that digital entrepreneurship is really the future. And you should seriously consider starting your own business or joining a digital startup. Why? Um, these are some of the businesses started by my students who sat in my class um, over the years. Uh, anyone recognize this? Yeah, class of clans. They sat in my class. Then they decided to start their own business. Um, in the first year, they did something like they generated revenue of maybe $200,000. The next year, it was about $10 million. And, and three years later, they sold their business. Um, oh, oh, no, four years later, they eventually sold their business to Chinese Tencent for a cool $10 billion. So this was not a unicorn. Unicorn is someone who reaches the valuation of 1 billion. They actually did 10 times that in 10 billion. A lot of money. Why? Because they had an innovative business model and it was a digital business. So it was infinitely scalable. Scaling the business didn't cost them anything. All they needed to do was to get their business model right. 
And you know, that's a nice return for effort. All the other businesses too are digital businesses. In total, these businesses are worth today roughly, um, well, actually, I don't know the latest, but it must be in the region of 15 billion US dollars. Um, and I like to think that it's all because of what I taught them. Um, I like to, you to believe too. So it's good to, good for you to be here. Um, right. So um, what I'm going to share with you, this is some of my background. And Jana mentioned this. I, I was in the founding team of Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. I'm going to share a little bit of data about how entrepreneurship operates in Colombia and what kind of entrepreneurship do you have here. Um, this is the Wicked Acceleration Labs that Jana mentioned. So what we try to do with this lab is facilitate solutions to some of the big challenges that we experience today, including, you know, global pandemics, uh, climate change, um, societal issues, inequality, uh, what have you, circular economy. Um, why am I showing this and why, why do I think this is important? I think today, because obviously we know that our planet is not limitless, any new business today needs to have a sustainability mission in one way or another. So it's not only about making money. You have to make money to be sustainable. And that's actually, that's a paradox of sustainable business. In order to be truly sustainable, contribute to environmental societal sustainability you have to be even more focused on the bottom line and make sure that if you don't make money you won't be sustainable you won't deliver on your sustainability mission because you will be out of business sooner than you know know it so this is what we do with wicked acceleration labs what you need to do if you start the business yes you need to have a clear idea of how you are going to make money but you also need to think about well how do i contribute to the planet one way or another. People, it's about profit, not only about profit, it's about profit, people, and planet. Uh, so, how, well, this I will skip. So, we, we do wicked acceleration. Resolving climate change is a very complex thing. So, you know, wicked acceleration uh, requires developing solutions to wicked challenges, requires um, tools and frameworks that are able to handle with this complexity. So here we have um, a kind of a map of the various effects of the COVID pandemic on business society, um, people within society, and so on and so forth. So you can see that many of the wiki challenges we have to deal with are complex. They are wickedly complex. And somehow in order to change things, and, and this is the key for sustainability. We need to change those systems. We need to understand how those systems work, how they create the problems, what are the causal chains, and how do we break those causal chains. So we wicked acceleration labs. We develop tools for that. We collaborate with the World Economic Forum. They have a Scale 360 platform and playbook that our team helped them design. And this playbook supports uh, the creation and promotion implementation of re, um, circular economy projects in different regions. So you can see all these um, green circles here. So this is where they have implemented um, these circularity projects in order to promote economic circularity and reduce the uh, negative externality or the environmental footprint of uh, economic activity. So one project took place in Chile, there was one in Argentina and in virtually all the other work regions. How do we do this? Um, here we have the Chile example. How do we do this? We take a whole systems view. We go beyond lean entrepreneurship. Some of you might have, if you have taken entrepreneurship courses, you might have heard about lean entrepreneurship, which is a very effective way of developing business models, especially for digital businesses. It's a great method, it's a great heuristic, but it's also fairly narrowly focused on specific customers' problems as they currently experience them. And it's very effective in doing that, that this is what you need in digital business model development. If you also want to contribute to the wider system within which you operate, 
you know, deliver on your social and environmental sustainability missions, then you need to start a little bit from a little bit further back and think about how does the system work. You need to map the system, understand, understand causal loops in order to develop interventions. And these are portfolios of interventions that are desired, designed to break some of those causal chains such that the negative externalities are eliminated. So this is very much, and this is how the playbook looks like. It, it's all in the middle. And then we develop various kinds of frameworks and test them and see what works. And then we imp uh, improve them. And, and here we have intervention selector. So it's all about facilitating solutions in multi-stakeholder environments where you need many different parties to collaborate in order to actually deliver a positive change on the system. Um, here we have, uh, um, I'm, I'll be sharing some of the insights from the Entrepreneurial Resilience Project, where we looked at um, how entrepreneurs promote um, resilience in a situation where the society faces a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic. And somehow we need to keep the economy going, even though we have lockdowns. And, and how do entrepreneurs actually do that? How, you know, how do they survive those kinds of crises? Um, so that's about me and some of the projects where I'm going to draw the insight that I'm now going to share to you. So this is what I'm trying to convince you of today. I need to somehow find a place where to keep this. I'll just put it here. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah. Amazing. Ah, So my message is there are entrepreneurs and there are entrepreneurs. Not all entrepreneurs contribute equally to economic development. Um, and some types of businesses are easier to kick up, uh, get going than others. The quality of entrepreneurs varies dramatically across countries. Some countries might have a lot of entrepreneurs who make a little contribution to the economy. Other countries might have fewer entrepreneurs who make a big contribution to the economic and economic prosperity and welfare. Institutional conditions have a big effect on the quality of the entrepreneurial dynamic in your country. So policymakers really need to pay attention to the framework conditions within business takes place in a given country that will have a big impact on how entrepreneurs are going to contribute to economic prosper, uh, prosperity and also sustainability. Digital framework conditions. Remember, I'll be talking about digital business a lot. Digital framework conditions have a similarly huge, big impact on the quality of entrepreneurship in the country. And I have the data to prove it, by the way. So I'll be proving it to you. Digital entrepreneurs perform better. So if you want to start the business, make sure that it um, leverages digital technologies and infrastructures, you will be performing better, you will be more sustainable, and you will be more resilient. So digital really is the key. Um, and how do you nurture digital entrepreneurs? This has implications for universities, um, governments, and, and also for prospective entrepreneurs, such as many of you could be. You need to have a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem in order to really be able to effectively design a scalable digital business model. So what is an entrepreneurial ecosystem? I'll, I'll share some thoughts about that. And in the big picture, by investing in institutional framework conditions, and this is the message for policy, and digital uh, framework conditions, institutional conditions and digital framework conditions, you will have more digital entrepreneurship, which will drive progress towards a digital economy where we all are heading. So we really need to think about these issues in order to be prepared for business in tomorrow. So first insight, there are entrepreneurs and there are entrepreneurs. What does that actually mean? So, well, here we have data from Global Entrepreneurship Monitor 
and the black areas are countries where we didn't have data from in this particular year i tried to pick a year that was particularly representative and we had data from many countries red is better red means that the gem consortium sees more self-employment activity in the country and yellow the lighter colors mean that there's less entrepreneurial activity in the country or less self-employment activity in the country and we were looking at the percentage of adult age individuals who were currently trying to start a new business or were operating one and you can see that the differences across countries are quite dramatic Colombia is on the red end of the scale so Colombia has more entrepreneurship or it has more self-employment activity 24 percent that's one every fourth individual either is self-employed in some way, has a business, or is, is trying to start one. Ecuador is even more entrepreneurial, according to this metric. And Zimbabwe seems to be the most entrepreneurial country on the planet. Hmm. Doesn't quite sound right, does it? US, 10%. UK, 6%. Finland, 4%. Of five percent. So what's going on here? If we look at here, we have three groups. Um, we have low-income economies here, and here we have um, uh, here we have Zambia, and this is another year of data. Here we have medium-income countries. Here we have Colombia, by the way, and here we have high-income countries. And UK is somewhere here, and Finland is somewhere here too. So we tend to see that the more prosperous the country, the less self-employment activity it has. Well, this, well, why would this be? Well, the simple explanation for this group here is that Zambia has a lot of people selling baskets in street corners because the economy is unable to create high quality employment and jobs. In high income economies, you have lots of employment opportunities, especially if you are well-educated. You have high human capital. You don't need to start a business to survive, to generate income. So that was one observation. By the way, when we started this consortium in 1997, I actually wrote the first project plan for a Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. Um, this thing here, you can go and find it uh, in Google. We thought that, of, of course, you know, the richer the country, the more it will have innovative entrepreneurs because it's innovative entrepreneurs who create wealth, right? And we saw the exact opposite. So we understood that, well, maybe, you know, you have different kinds of entrepreneurs. You have necessity entrepreneurs who need to start a business because they cannot find high quality employment. And these are the people that end up selling fruit and baskets in street corners. They won't contribute much to the economy. They will be important because they will gener help generate income for the individual. So, you know, it's not like um, they are somehow um, bad, but it, it's they're not going to contribute to the economy. So we created this Global Entrepreneurship Index where we took into account not only the quantity of entrepreneurial activity, but also the quality of it. How many of these businesses actually product innovate? How many of these businesses introduce products and services that are new to their customers? How many of these businesses have customers that are not in the same country, so they have some international activity? And so on and so forth. How many of these businesses had uh, founders with university degrees? If you have founders with higher human capital, those founders are more likely to be, you know, create innovative businesses because they have the capacity to do that. And how well did the country's framework conditions, you know, country level conditions actually support the growth and scaling of those businesses? So if you start a highly innovative business and you do it in, say, Zimbabwe, the likelihood is that you are not going to grow very rapidly. Why? Because the local environment, the economy, economy uh, institutional conditions in Zimbabwe probably will not be able to support rapid scaling of your business. If you start an innovative business in Silicon Valley in the US, 
you're more likely to be successful because the context is simply better able to support the growth of your business. So taking all those kinds of factors into account, now we see that Colombia is not necessarily leading in terms of the quality of its entrepreneurial resource allocation dynamic in the economy, but it's somewhere in the middle. So now we have, and this makes much more sense, if you take quality into account, you would expect to see US score high in terms of innovative, high impact entrepreneurship. So we have Switzerland, we have Canada, Denmark, UK, where I come from, I actually have two passports. One is UK, one is Finnish, Australia, Iceland, Netherlands, Ireland, Sweden, and Finland is also doing pretty well. So now we see what we are expecting. So you really need to think about the quality of entrepreneurial activity. Well, that quality, uh, we can see, and this is index scale, by the way, is from zero to 100. And Ecuador is not uh, the lowest. We actually had more countries, but I you know, couldn't fit them all on, onto this uh, slide. So we have US is close to 100, which is the theoretical maximum. And then Ecuador is about you know, less than one quarter of the quality or impact potential of the US when it comes to the entrepreneurial dynamic. So here we have another way to look at it. This is the ratio between formal sector and informal sector entrepreneurs. Formal sector entrepreneurs are businesses who actually register their business. They pay their taxes, they pay their licenses, and so on and so forth. Informal sector entrepreneurs are businesses that do not register their business. They try to fly under the radar and um, you know, quite often they don't pay tax. They just, you know, operate in the gray economy. So this is the ratio between entrepreneurs who register their business and who do not. It's one way to measure the quality of the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial dynamic in a country. And here we see UK is actually at the bottom. Finland is here. And again, you see the high income countries having mostly formal sector entrepreneurs and then countries like Indonesia, India, Philippines, Pakistan, Egypt, Ghana, Uganda, Bolivia, and so on, they tend to see mostly informal sector activity. And Colombia is here, so fairly high percentage. Or actually, the majority is formal sector activity. So what's the message here? We would like to see more formal sector entrepreneurs, because if you operate in the gray economy, you know, you are less likely to generate a significant income. You are less likely to invest because of poor, poorer property protection. If you register your business, then you know the wealth that you accumulate will be protected. If you operate informally, you basically are um, living with you know hand-to-mouth existence, and you basically consume what you earn immediately. You are not investing, and therefore you are not improving your potential to really make an impact on the economy. This ratio, by the way, if you think in terms of social sciences, the difference between the leading and, and the least well-doing economies, this ratio, you know, Indonesia has 3,250 times more informal sector businesses, relatively speaking, than the UK. And, you know, this is one of the biggest differences you can see in social sciences. It's, it's really huge. One standard, and also institutional conditions have a big impact. So one standard deviation difference in institutional quality, um, and I'll tell you in a second what that means, we can have up to 50% impact on that ratio. So we are talking about huge institutional effects here. Um, and I have more data on that. So there are entrepreneurs and there are entrepreneurs. Um, you know, in the bottom left, you have Vito Corleone, the uh, famous head of the uh, Corleone family and uh, godfather. Um, well, he's also an entrepreneur. He spots an opportunity. He takes risks. He makes a lot of money. You know, he's an entrepreneur. 
is he a productive entrepreneur no because he makes money at the expense of the society he's a destructive entrepreneur we don't want that because we want our societies to work better anyone recognize this guy Carlos Slim. He doesn't look like his name. <laughs> um, he's at one point he was the richest individuals on the planet, and he, his business is you know mobile telephony operation, building and operating mobile telephony networks. He was rich because he he was specialized in creating regional monopolies and exploiting those monopolies. So he was rich, but so were also or that also meant that the mobile telephony charges in the areas where he operated were some of the highest in the planet so he was making fat profits again did he do good for society in the end probably not uh, then we have two Columbia unicorns everyone knows Rappi and anybody recognize these guys that's the second hobby exactly hobby that's the second columbia unicorn at this point before liquitech becomes the third <laughs> um so what's going on here um this is by the way a great example of digital entrepreneurship both of these are digital businesses rapi they create a platform that's easy to access. Everyone carries a mobile phone, so everyone can connect to their platform and order some food. Because it's easy to access, you can, basically they are creating a critical mass of supply, people who want, need to eat, and um, or supply restaurants making food, and people making food, and then demand people who want to eat. Once you have a critical scale, the kind of uh, random fluctuations in supply and demand tend to get evened out. And actually, now you are in a position to make money and you have a viable business operation. Rappi doesn't make food. It only connects supply and demand. It does it digitally. It's inherently scalable, easily accessible. That's why they are so and, um, profitable and valuable. So Simon Boreo and Sebastian Meyer here. Hubby. It's the same business model, just applied in a different context. So their promise is that if you sell your house, you will get your cash in 10 days. We know that in Colombia, even if you sell your house, you know, getting a loan, house loan, house mortgage, you know, can take weeks and weeks and weeks because banks have monopolies and they are not really interested in making the process smoother. And, you know, if you sell your house, you would like to see your cash as soon as possible. You don't, you, you can't afford to wait, wait for weeks. Their offering is, we have a platform, again, we connect supply and demand, and we do it in such a way that we will be able to guarantee to you that you will receive your cash within 10 days. You don't have to go through banks, go through, go through them. Simple, great business model. Banks are not being very efficient they have little interest in changing their ways because they have monopolies therefore we have a problem people selling their houses they have a problem let's create a digital platform to resolve that problem you don't have to start a bank to create a digital service with which you can outrun and outcompete banks and become a very uh, uh, rich and prosperous business in your own right. So digital entrepreneurship is very different from physical entrepreneurship. If you start making products, you start making shoes, you need to buy machines, you need to have a factory, you need to have production facilities. In order to grow your business, you need, to, you need a lot of cash because now you need to buy more machines and you need to buy more floor space and everything. So to grow, you need cash. If you start a digital platform that operates in the cloud and the scaling of that platform is virtually free to grow your business all you need to do is to hit on the right business model 
and the rest is history. And that's the key difference. That's the key difference between digital and um, physical entrepreneurship. Then one point on sustainability, which is kind of important for me and I suppose for everyone. So here's a model entrepreneur. Anyone know Patagonia, Patagonia clothing? This is the icon of sustainable business. And there's a, many, many stories about it. Uh, but these guys, by being sustainable, they invested a lot of money to become sustainable. They developed a reputation of truly being a sustainable company whose mission is to be sustainable. And that meant that people wanted to pay more for the clothing they sold. They were actually, and they are still able to charge 30% greater margin than their competitors because by virtue of their sustainability. People want to buy clothing from them because they know that they do sustainable clothing and therefore, you know, by buying their clothes, I'm also contributing to sustainability. So now they have converted that profit-making mission such that the mission for the people and planet comes first and the Patagonia still makes this profit by charging those higher margins, but the, it's making these profits in order to pay back for the planet and people. And that's, they are now basically giving, uh, Yves Schoenau gave, gave all his shares and donated them to environmental trusts and created a structure where now they are sustainably working, not for the benefit of shareholders, but for the benefit of planet. And this is kind of very interesting and hope, I hope this will be the uh, paradigm for the future. Okay, uh, back to, uh, where are we? Um, back to present, so I have used something like 30 minutes. Okay, um, I have roughly 30 minutes left. Okay, so remember those big differences in formal informal ratios and productive and entre unproductive entrepreneurs. So this is what our, our data tells us. If you improve rule of law conditions in, in your country, that means, you know, reduce corruption, make sure that contracts are can be enforced and the uh, courts treat everyone um, equally and all that. If you improve conditions, rule of law, your country by one standard deviation, which is in this case, roughly 1%, you will be a 30% increase in the ratio between formal and informal entrepreneurship in the country. That's a huge impact. That's roughly the difference between India and Malaysia. If you improve prote property protection conditions and legislation in your country by one standard deviation, again, maybe by 10% or so, you will see a 20% increase in formal entrepreneurship of increase in the formal informal entrepreneurship ratio if you increase the cost of registering your business by 10 to 20 percent it will be a 50 percent reduction you will see more people choosing not to register their business now these are huge effects so institutional conditions really matter for the quality of entrepreneurship in your country how does this work at the individual level so why, why do we see these big differences? Well, you are going to university and you are here to build your human capital, which is your education and skills, what you can do, and your social capital, you know, people who know your networks, your contact networks. That's a big investment. That's like, you know, several years of your life. It's a lot of money, all the rest. Once you graduate from the university, what do you want to do with your human and social capital? Well, you need to earn an, you, you need to earn a living. You need to earn an income. You need to grow a family. You need to buy a house. You know, that all costs money. So you want to use your education and in, invest those assets, your human and social capital to the career opportunity that is most likely to help you, you know, earn that income that you will need to buy. Uh, buy a house, you know, raise a family, all that. Now, institutional, and then, you know, if you think about, should I do that? 
by starting my own business, am, am I, you know, likely to generate, make a good living that way? Or should I go work for someone else? Institutional conditions, you know, rule of law, property protection, those kinds of variables affect, affect the trade off that you see as an individual. If you see good conditions and if you see an environment where, you know, actually you think that you could really make a good living by becoming an entrepreneur in addition to, you know, be able to be independent and, and be your own boss and all that, um, and also experience the rewards of succeeding, then you are more likely to become an entrepreneur. If you see more risks that maybe there's corruption and, you know, uh, the monopolies and you know banks are not giving um, banks are you know giving you penalizing interest rates if you try to lend money as an entrepreneurial business then you are not likely to start your own business it's safer to go work for someone else you know it's those kinds of trade-offs that then cause these huge effects that we see here so we looked at you know, building on this idea that it's really the individual choices that matter, but country level institutional conditions affect the trade-offs that we see. Then we decided to explore whether, you know, it actually works in practice. So we use the GEM data and as the dependent variable, we have proxies for the productivity potential of entrepreneurs. So we are looking at the quality of the new business in terms of new product innovation, introducing new products and services, export activity and high growth expectations. And, you know, we just, uh, I won't spend too much on the detail. Uh, we did this research in a set of Asian countries because we were working together with Asian Development Bank. Uh, we had something like 214,000 individuals whose choices we analyzed. And, um, and I'll just very quickly highlight, so again, you know, it's really a small percentage of entrepreneurs that are likely to generate a non-trivial impact on the economy. So for 73%, three, well, no, nearly 80%, 75% of the businesses had no export activity. Three quarters of entrepreneurs will never export anything in these countries. Roughly half of them didn't do any product innovation. And if you look at the employment growth expectations, only 1% of new businesses in a given cohort in that country, 1% in total, they were going to be responsible for over 50% of new employment created by all new entrepreneurs in that country. 1% promising to create over 50% of new employment created by entrepreneurs. So, you know, that's strong bias. Um, 44% of the entrepreneurs, they will only hire no one or at maximum, at most two people, and they will only create 3.3% of total employment created by entrepreneurs in a given cohort. Again, it's, it's, you know, this productivity potential, impact potential is highly concentrated. So basically, what do we see? We see that if um, you have stronger property right protection, you have less corruption, you have better financial development, more funding available for entrepreneurs, then you are likely to see more businesses innovating. You're also likely to see more businesses engaging in export activity. And you're more, yeah, and the, uh, for employment expectations, it, it was a little bit more mixed, but we do see some positive effects for controlling for everything. So basically, again, to reinforce the message that institutional conditions matter. What this statistic says, I'll bore you with the statistic, uh, I'll spare you of the statistical details, but what it says is that control for well-educated in individuals will be particularly sensitive to the level of corruption in your country. So if you have more corruption in the country, it is the university graduates 
that are less likely to start new businesses. So control for corruption is really important for encouraging new business creation by educated individuals, whereas availability of funding is most likely to help people with lower education. So what we see here, we see that different institutional conditions are likely to affect different segments of the population. So kind of nice to know thing, but that's interesting. Okay, digital conditions, we did the same study looking at various um, measures of the quality of the digital infrastructure in your country, availability of it, uh, ease of access, uh, price of access, uh, country level coverage, that kind of those kinds of things. And we see largely the same effects, actually even more strongly, very strong positive impact on new production, um, new product innovation. So the better your digital infrastructure, the easier it is to access it. You will see more product innovation by new businesses. You will see more export activity by new businesses. And these stars mean that, you know, this impact is real and strong. And, and you see also more high growth expectations. So the digital framework conditions in a country are really important because they're more, they will encourage digital businesses. How big are these effects? Um, one standard deviation improvement in the quality of digital framework conditions had a roughly 10 percent positive impact on new, new product innovation, roughly five to six to seven percent impact on export activity, and maybe two to three percent impact on um, high growth creation or employment creation likelihood. So by improving your digital conditions by 10 percent, you will be from and you know look depending on the proxy, but again, non-trivial improvement in the entrepreneurial dynamic in the country. Well, if you start the digital business, you are more likely to perform better than your competitors. If you are more digital than your competition, you are more likely to perform better. We did this survey in ASEAN, and what's the essence here is if you use more digital resources, you are more digital business like um, um, Liquitech. That means that you can more flexibly experiment with your business model. You can try out different things at low cost. And you can try more things, and then you can pick those things that work for you. And you, you, you know, any tweaks in your business model, how you create value, how, how you deliver that value to the customer, what is your revenue model? What is your cost model? Um, digital entrepreneurs are more likely to experiment and then you know they are more likely to discover those business models that really do work. And here's the statistics to prove it. Believe me, it's solid. It's good data. They are more sustainable. Again, using the same data, we also measured sustainability performance, and this is in relation to UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we see the same effect. The more you use digital resources, the more you will experiment with your business model, and that will particularly affect your environmental sustainability of your internal operations. You create less waste, and it also will increase your enhance your impact, and this is a positive impact in the local community where you operate. More digital, bus digital businesses are more sustainable. Here is how we measure the um, digitalization. Our human resource processes are fully digitalized. Our customer management system is fully digitalized. Our accounting system, so we looked at different functions in the businesses. And here is environmental sustainability. This is this relates to operations. We make great effort to use environmentally friendly materials and, and products and operations. We go well beyond the minimum required by legal authorities to minimize any negative impact of our business on the environment, waste recycling. We recycle all, all our waste and so on and so forth. So digital businesses are more likely to do 
these kinds of things, and this is good for the planet. Uh, social sustainability, we go well beyond the minimum to minimize any negative impact of our business in the local community. We create less waste, we create less pollution, we create less noise, what have you. We take great effort to make a positive contribution. We have a social mission clearly defined. We donate to those in need. We have a system in place to ensure we keep focused on social mission. It's very important for us to be a good corporate citizen in our community. The scale is longer, but those where digital businesses are more likely to do these kinds of things. And they're also more resilient. One big me message here is, how am I doing with time? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of doing OK. Yeah, I'm doing OK. Um, The message here, it's a complex graph, so I'll explain it to you. Um, here we have three consecutive economic recessions, and this is in the US, 18 to 86. The bottom year of that recession was 1983. 89 to 1995, the bottom year was 1992, 91, 92. And 1999 to 2005, the bottom year there was something like 2002, something like that. Economic downturn. Here we see the balance between small businesses and large businesses in terms of creating or shedding jobs, letting people go or uh, not letting people go during a recession. Anything above this line means that it's the large businesses that are creating more jobs than small businesses. Anything below means that small businesses are more likely to create or preserve jobs than our large businesses. And what do we see? We see that during the depths of the recession, it's really the small businesses that are responsible for preserving employment. Large businesses are laying off people as quickly as they can. When the economy picks up again, then the large businesses start recruiting. But at the death of the recession, and this includes COVID, it's the entrepreneurial sector that really protects the economy and jobs in the economy. So with this information, we looked at, you know, 50 businesses, we've shadowed them for over two years in China, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and the UK. And we looked at, well, you know, how did the COVID affect entrepreneurial businesses? The message here is that it's these, this share of the businesses really were hit dramatically or they saw customer demand for their products and services fall dramatically. But then we have these businesses here that actually saw an increase in customer demand. So the crisis doesn't affect everyone in the same way. And so this is roughly, these don't qualify. So this is roughly, you know, 40% um, of the businesses actually see a positive impact by the crisis. And, and this is something that happens. Not everyone suffers. Some suffer less and some actually see an increase. So what we saw was, um, you know, roughly half of the business saw the crisis open new opportunities elsewhere. And half of the businesses didn't. But what does this mean? This creates an opportunity for entrepreneurs to discover opportunity in the crisis. A um, very important lesson here, students, listen closely. The greater the crisis, the greater the opportunity. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity for those to solve the problem. Entrepreneurs are particularly good at spotting opportunity, even in a crisis. And that's very important. And this is how the entrepreneurs that we shut out did it. They started experimenting with their business models because they saw some sort of demand go away. Well, let's experiment. 
they took on digitalization, you know, because of obvious things like social distancing for what have you. You experiment with your business model. The obvious thing is you are a restaurant. People cannot come to your restaurant, so you need to make the food go to your customers. And you do that digitally. You know, that's business model experimentation. That's entrepreneurs thinking on their feet because they need to survive. They don't have the big resources available for large business. Particularly interesting, when faced with the crisis pandemic, as members of the community, we have an external threat that threatens everyone. Entrepreneurs take on social missions. They start thinking about, well, how can we help our community? And this is a real effect. They seek opportunity in the crisis and they engage with one another to help each other survive. So um, we see here, long story cut short, uh, not applicable here. Here we have companies already having a distinct social mission. We have roughly half of those, a little more than half of those who qualified didn't take on social missions, but nearly half did. With the, when the crisis hits, half of the qualifying entrepreneurs actually start thinking about, well, how do we help our local communities? How do they do that? We have Chinese business, businesses adopting an altruistic attitude, helping others, helping. We have see entrepreneurs starting to give help and advice to their peers that they don't normally do, organize knowledge sharing seminars to share tips and strategies to stay afloat volunteering to mentor one another, help one another, um, donating revenue and profits for their local needs, donating food, face masks, personal protective equipment to individuals and non-profits. You know, we have fishing bait manufacturers donating fishing baits to fishermen to, you know, help them continue to feed their families. So we had and this is something we didn't expect. But entrepreneurs not only help, are, are more resilient by themselves, especially if they are digital, they also help their local communities in the face of a crisis. Uh, so here's the process model, too com complex, but the more you have digital resources here, the more you see experimentation, improvisation, and those sorts of things, the more you see them changing their business models, how they work, and then the more they are likely to survive and also create a positive impact on their communities. Well, I skip this because I want to get to the final point. And, you know, we can hear from Liquitec, who is doing all these great things. So, uh, yeah. So, um, two points to make. Well, how does this relate to entrepreneurial ecosystems? Um, today, everything seems to be an ecosystem. You know, we have we have an auditorium ecosystem here. Uh, and, you know, everything is an ecosystem, and that means that nothing is an ecosystem. So what really is an ecosystem, and what is an entrepreneurial ecosystem, and why is it important for digital entrepreneurship? Well, Innovation ecosystems, think about Apple um, uh, App Store. That's an innovation ecosystem. We have a platform and you have uh, developers who can, you know, come up with innovative ap applications and they make them available through the platform. So there's what's known as generative innovation, unprompted innovation by large audiences of developers. And that's the difference between the App Store and supply chain. No one tells those developers that now you need to develop this and this application. This is what you do in a supply chain situation. So this is new about innovation ecosystems. The key word, generative innovation. Unprompted innovative inputs uh, from large audiences. Entrepreneurial ecosystems are completely different. Entrepreneurial ecosystems are a digital economy phenomenon. They are regional communities of accelerators, people who provide funding, prospective entrepreneurs, advisors of startups, and so on and so forth. They are regional communities whose mission is to facilitate 
the creation and scale up of new businesses that compete. And here's the distinction with digital business models. So that's a multiple. They look like they're in, in, in the bottom right. Um, so these are kind of institutional structures. So innovation ecosystem is the developer community around App Store. That's an innovation ecosystem. They innovate new applications and they make them available through App Store. Entrepreneurial ecosystem is a community that supports the creation and scaling of digital startups. And these are digital startups because that's what is distinctive here. Entrepreneurial ecosystems promote business model innovation. And the next message is going to be a little bit complex. I hope I'll be able to make it clear because it's really important. How are entrepreneurial ecosystems, these communities, how are they different from clusters or industrial agglomerations, you know, any other concentration of economic activity? Well, cluster, think about furniture cluster. You have lots of furniture businesses in a region and they make furniture, physical businesses. Why do they concentrate on the same region? Because if you have, the more you have furniture businesses in a given region, the more those businesses learn how to make furniture. And they, they will have, you know, access to people who know how to make furniture, so they will have access to specialized resources, as we call it. And everyone becomes better at, at making furniture. But because they are furniture businesses, they compete against one another and, and therefore they have little incentive to share. There's what's known as knowledge spillovers still taking place. The businesses learn from one another, but it's not because I volunteer to share all my insights with the others. They just observe what I do and they then they kind of try to do something similar. So in a cluster, you develop, you get access and develop sector specific knowledge. But the downside is that everyone within the cluster competes against one another. In an entrepreneurial ecosystem, the key technology is not sector specific. It's not techniques and technologies required to make better furniture. This is a generic technology. We are talking about, you know, digital technologies, business model recipes, and those kinds of things. This is a generic recipes on how to organize your business and taking advantage of digital infrastructures. So here we have a situation where, you know, we have uh, facturation business coming up with new ways and, you know, they operate, they join the entrepreneurial ecosystem because they know that they will find new ways to use those digital infrastructures, you know, develop better digital uh, revenue models, what have you, with which they can compete, not against one another, but compete against those big banks who refuse to change, uh, who are cumbersome and expensive and slow. And then we have, might have, you know, Rappi, joining a new venture accelerator so that they come up, can learn how they can best organize their food delivery business. Now, Rappi won't be competing against Hubby and they won't be, be competing against Liquitech. And that means that we have all these guys experimenting, you know, in the same new venture accelerator, experimenting with different business models and sharing their insights with one another because the more you share the better you can compete against those banks or those you know uh, taxi businesses or whatever so that's a very big difference entrepreneurial ecosystems are all about sharing insights and experimenting with different business models by entrepreneurs and sharing insight of what works and that way Everyone has an incentive to share their insight because that everyone will benefit. And this is different from clusters. The technology is not sector specific. Entrepreneurs bring their sector 
knowledge. They bring their background in banking, whatever they see that banks are really poor at doing mortgages or really poor at facturation or what have you. The entrepreneurs will carry that knowledge. They join the accelerator so they can design a business model that will outcompete the bank. Uh, universities need to be at the center of this. And this is, by the way, this is easy to learn. And for you students out there, the up, uh, potential upside returns are high and down, downside risks are low because it's easy and cheap to develop a platform. It's easy and cheap to experiment with different kinds of platforms and business models because you do it all digitally. You don't actually have to buy phys physical assets to do that. Uh, universities can effectively teach this and they can help and, you know, they, they can lower the barrier to starting a new business. And so, you know, starting a digital business becomes a more vi viable career option. This is different from technology push businesses that we typically see at the universities and we all already have established solutions. Science parks are all about technology push, taking a given technology and commercializing it. Accelerators are all about discovering these digital business models and outcompeting those industry incumbents, as we call them, those banks who have become lazy over the years and who don't serve their customers very well anymore. This is how it works theoretically. This is to prove the point. Uh, okay, let's move to implications. If you're thinking about starting a new business, what do I compete with? If I'm, you know, want to compete primarily against with the new business models as Rapid does, as Habit does, as uh, Liquitech does, then you should join an entrepreneurial ecosystem. You should go into a new venture accelerator. If you are thinking about digitalizing your business model, you should do so. Do you have strong industry or technology background? This is really important. Remember, entrepreneur needs to be bringing the expertise in banking. Ideally, you will have worked for a bank and you have discovered what the banks are particularly bad at doing. That is the problem that you can focus on and you can resolve with digital business models. Have I spotted opportunities to disrupt the given industry sector? Pretty much the same message. Fintech, huge opportunities there, especially in countries like Colombia, where banks, established banks are lazy. Uh, do I know how to develop and validate a business idea? If you need to learn, well, how do I experiment with different business ideas and models, then join. A venture accelerator. Well, it turns out that, you know, it's not all about digital businesses outcompeting established incumbents they can also see entrepreneurial ecosystems as a strategic gateway um, of engaging digital businesses and basically enhance their own and rethink their own business models especially if they have a corporate accelerator and they want to learn to become more entrepreneurial policy this is really important policy implication. Entrepreneurship policymakers are really good at nurturing clusters, but they are not really that good at nurturing entrepreneurial ecosystems. So they need to learn that. Um, there are different ways of doing it. I'll skip this. This is something we did in Thailand. But what Colombia needs to think about is, well, and this is policy for policy implication, how do we nurture entrepreneurial ecosystems in different regions? How do we help create those communities? And how, how do we ensure that, you know, regions in this case can learn from Bogota, which is likely to have the more, most advanced entrepreneurial ecosystem? How do we connect Barranquilla to the Bogota entrepreneurial ecosystem such that everyone benefits? So these are some considerations for policy, but that's 
my 60 minutes used so i'll end, end, end up here and i invite alejandro to give his perspective yes now please come here and then maybe i suggest that then we can have a discussion and we can have questions okay thank you thank you very much oh sorry thank you i took my notes oh <laughs> yes <Good. laughs> let me organize this can i lose the microscope no the microphone <laughs> i'm joking okay and let me try this okay perfect okay okay thank you very much everyone for being here i was one of you guys uh, this is a special moment for me because this is my university i'm a former student of the universidad del norte uh, first i want to thank you the universidad del norte maria clemencia and uh jana <laughs> i'm sorry for for inviting me here and the cathedra um, um, Erko, and thank you for sharing this scenario with me. It's an honor for me, believe me. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I took my notes, and I agree with a lot of things you already said. It's not only about making money. The we gotta have a sustainability, sustainability mission. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. Do you hear me? Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the second one. The context is very important. For example, Silicon Valley, you will have more resources to develop an idea, for example. You got to start formal. This is very important because you got to protect uh, with strong basis. You got to protect your knowledge. This is easy. to. You, you got to develop something easy to access because we you have to connect the supply and the demand. And also, uh, what you got to find is new products, services. For example, uh, when when we were developing Liquitech, we find some services around Liquitech, for example, the electronic signature. So we make the service for another company. So it's new business model that are from the original business model. Also, the, and this one was the, the one that I liked more. The big crisis, the bigger the crisis, the bigger the opportunity. And it goes to Liquitec because in the COVID, we grew 30, 300% uh, of, the, of the operation. And the more competitors you have around, the more you can learn. We call it not competition. This is competition. And you know a lot because you said you got to be uh, because you are going against the lazy banks and the slow banks yeah and uh, slow no lazy okay thank you so but first i'm going to introduce myself i'm alejandro nami i'm a former student of this university oh uh, i am the co-founder of liquitech which is a fintech factoring a company. It was born in Barranquilla four years ago uh, with my three partners. And what 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 we have been doing, what really what we have been doing, it's everything about transformation, always improving and creativity. Because you know, I'm a I'm a believer that we don't create a lot of new things anymore. We are taking things that already exist, we improve, and then we create new ways to do it. We always are, you know, uh, looking for opportunities, uh, making simpler, and, ah, for example, I'm, I'm gonna make an example. For example, the evolution of how we consume, how we play music, something th simple. But for example, 70 years ago, last decade, no, last decade, no, last century, in the 50s, <laughs> in the 50s, how we play the music. We use the long play disc and we play it 
with a long play this player, <laughs> something like that. I think some of you didn't knew this. <laughs> and then like 20 years, we got the cassette. And what was the improvement? The portability, because the disc was this size and the cassette disc was only this size. So the, improve, the improvement was the portability, but the music was the same. Then 10 years later comes the, came the CDs, the compact discs. What was the improvement? The quality of the music. And then in the early, maybe you knew the iPods. <laughs> it came the MP3 players with the improvement of capacity, quality, and also another characteristics like you can filter the artist or you can make a playlist like now. But how do we listen or play music now? Digitalization, digital platforms. We are now with our smartphone connected in the cloud with a platform online for a monthly fee to with access to all the music streaming online in the same moment. <laughs> if I have told if I had told myself this 30 years ago, I would thought that I was totally crazy. <laughs> but that's what we're doing now in Liquitech. Because in Liquitech we transform the way we used to make factoring operations. We make factoring operations, we build a digital platform to execute factoring operations. But what is factoring? Because <laughs> Not everybody should know what is factoring. I'm going to make an example. Oh, okay. How can it? Yeah. For example, if you are a company, let's say you are a company and you sell something. You are a company and you sell a product or you sell a service. And when you sell something, you make an invoice, la factura, because you are a supplier, you are a proveedor. So when you make the invoice, there are two important things in this invoice. That is the amount, for example, 100 million pesos, and the term of the payment, the term that you are going to collect the payment of this invoice. And in this country, we have terms like 60, 90, and almost 120 days. But as a supplier, as a small and medium company, I need to collect now. I need my money now because I, I got to pay the payroll and I'm, I have to buy more raw materials. So what I do is to, I'm going to Alejandro in Liquitec. Alejandro, I have this invoice, 100 million pesos. I'm going to collect in 60 days, but I need my money now. Can you pay me now? And I will tell myself, <laughs> yes, I can pay you now, but for a discount. For example, if the, the invoice, I can pay you now 90 million, not 100 million. I'm, I'm going to pay you 95 million. So I what I do is to pay him 95 million, I wait 60 days and then I collect 100. So everybody is going to be happy because he has his money now for a discount and I pay 95 and then I collect 100. Uh, so the, the difference is my income. But we did this in a traditional way before. All the partners, all uh, the, the, the company, we have a lot of experience in the, in the factoring sector, but how did we do the factoring before? It was with contracts, a printed signatures, the messenger, go to the notaria, review the, the, the signature, then go to the buyer, sign again, notaria, then comes, then call the notaria to check the signatures, and then I make the operation. It's like three to five days to make an operation. So with a digital platform where everything is online, the signature is an electronic signature, we made it in one day. So we didn't create something new we improve something that already exists. For example, uh, and what was the key aspects? We gain scope, the digitalization, more access, because for example, if there is one supplier, one company, un proveedor, in Medellin, for example, and one buyer in Bogota, and we're in Barranquilla, 
imagine the messenger going, going to all the cities. So with this is online. We do it in, in, in one day. Time is money. If we spend three or five days to make an operation, so we are uh, doing it better, faster. And also the security, because with the electronic signature, we make the identity validation or verification. That was one of the services that we are doing in, with other companies. So we are doing this now with more than 500 companies doing operations for more than $70 million each year. And also we recently closed a deal with a new partner that is an international fund. And we have an expectation to scale or multiply by 10 the activity that we are doing now. But also that is more important is the corporate social responsibility. Uh, I, 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 I took my note. <laughs> And we have, I think that if we want, if we want to see changes, we gotta act. You cannot expect something to change if you don't do anything. So we gotta make action now. For example, uh, when we make factoring operations, there is a portion of the profit that goes to fund a corporate so social responsibility program. For example, our corporate social responsibility program is called Young Woman Challenge. We select 20 uh, women uh, that is in a segment that calls Nini, ni estudian ni trabajan. They don't, they don't work and don't study. And we give them education and the capital seed money to start new business. I think that this is the way to, transform, to, to really have transformation. And also with factoring, we have inclusion because what we said before, uh, if you go in, if you go to a bank and ask for a loan, they take like, I don't know, they are not lazy, they are slow. <laughs> so, what would, yeah, just to close, what we should be doing now? When I made the other example about the music, it was with every improvement or, or every change was a new generation coming. New generation make things different. So what, and, and we're doing it now, we gotta be, make observation and how can, how people do things, how can I improve how people do things? Because with new generations, new ways to do the things. And we gotta take action. If you have an idea, make a business plan, present it to family and friends and start. And, and another note, <laughs> another note, because here in this industry, the digitalization and the fintechs or technology is easy and cheap to try. If you fail or you don't, or it doesn't work, you, you, gotta, you, you can try again. Before it wasn't like that. <laughs> if you broke, you owe money. <laughs> And thank you. This is Liquitec, uh, the power of the possible, el poder de lo posible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jana. Uh, thank you both Alejandro and Erko. Yes, uh, so um, the idea is now that you can uh, ask questions to them. I have some questions prepared, but of course, if you as students have questions, we take them first. You can also ask them in Spanish and I will help translating if that is a problem. So are there any questions for the moment being? None. Yeah, this one is working. Sorry. None. Okay. Hey. Where? Hey, whatever you want. Heiko. Yeah. So, I'll start with a question first, and I'll elaborate, and then maybe ask it again. Um, why are digital companies in regional ecosystems? Why are these? So these are companies which might be distributed, very digitalized, not necessarily working in the same space, founded by people in different cities. 
um, people working from home remotely, possibly from other countries, recruiting all around the world. Why are the ecosystems in which they are regional? And um, I think that's super important when we think about connecting the ecosystems of Colombia, right? So different ecosystems we have. Um, and also this is, this is relevant because I think I've heard it in the ecosystems here a lot that you don't start a global company in Colombia, you start it from Colombia. I don't know where Liquitech is, in, is, incubate, uh, is um, incorporated, but I've seen many Colombian startups incorporated in Delaware for exa exactly the property rights protection issues that you're not sure you're going to get international investment if you're incorporated in Colombia. Right? So, yeah, all of this leads us to the question, why are these super digital companies in regional ecosystems? Why, why, why the location? Okay, um, so let me address the regionally, the regionality question first. Um, funnily enough, you know, today uh, with um, you know Zoom and those kinds of things, you can, you know, like I used to have, I during lockdowns I would have one, you know, start the meeting. Um, start my day with a meeting in Singapore, and then I would have one or two meetings in Europe, and then I, towards the end of the day, I would be in the US. So you can do a lot of things, but what, what's important, uh, you know, uh, why are these regional? Because these businesses, they, ex they keep experimenting. It's, it's not like, you know, you have a readily thought through and plan business model from the outset that you then implemented. You had a plan first and then you implemented and you know the idea was crystal clear in your head in the beginning. That's no, not how it works. What you had a clear idea about was that we have a problem. And then what you do is you fall in love with the problem and then you start trying out different solutions. Well, how can I fix this problem? You don't necessarily have a clear solution from the outset. You need to experiment and you need to try different things. And this is why if you're a digital business, it's cheaper for you to do that. But those lessons from those experiments, they are more difficult to share online. And that's why you need this regional community. So you talk to others and you say that, well, I tried this and it didn't work. And what do I do now? And then the other guy says, and this is best, you know, just meeting in cafeteria or wherever. That, yeah, we had the same problem. And we did this and it worked really well. You know, those kinds of lessons don't travel digitally. And that's why you need regional uh, networks. And then, well, you know, how do you connect um, Paranquilla to Bogota? That's more about access to resources and creating contacts with people who really matter, you know, venture capitalists or particularly savvy business angel, what have you. It's kind of promoting interregional networking. It happens a little bit differently. So you bring people from Bogota here or you bring uh, people from here to Bogota and uh, then you talk about things. And, but the most important thing is that you meet people and, you know, you have this conversations in cafeterias, what have you. That's where the new ideas come from. But for the other bit, you know. No, no, no. Internationalization. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Over to you. <laughs> no, I, I, I was going to, to add something. Um, I think that the, the answer is replication or replicate. As well as the problems replicates regionally the solutions also. For example, we had a problem, we identified a problem of inclusion. The small and medium companies, 62% of them doesn't have access to traditional financial institutions. So we make a, 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 a way to include them in a system where can, that they can access to working capital without asking for a debt. So this is a, a solution in Colombia, but we have this problem around LATAM or I don't know, maybe in the world. So if we can make a solution, we can repl re replicate regionally. Uh, I think that this is like, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I would just add to that, that the challenge you will probably be facing is that, you know, banking regulations tend to be a little bit different in different countries. So 
you know, you cannot automatically scale internationally. And usually, you know, there's something that you need to tweak when you do that. Yeah. Uh, but the lesson here, and this is what I see my, my entrepreneurship students doing so many times, whether they are MBAs or undergraduates or executives is a simple lesson. Don't fall in love. And this is repeats what I said previously. Don't fall in love with the solution. Fall in love with the problem. And the second lesson, and this is a horrible expression, uh, but again, don't fall in love with the first idea that comes to your mind. Be prepared to kill your baby. And I don't mean it yeah. physically. The baby is your first idea. Be prepared to kill that one. Uh, because it's all about being in love with the solution and then trying different ways to solve it. You are you sure you didn't know me before? <laughs> because I already killed one. No, 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 I'm joking. No, we, when we started, we developed one platform, and about six months later, we kill it, and we start over again, because we tried and it didn't work the way we wanted. I think it's it has to be the problem has to be an obsession, like you say. Absolutely, and this is such an important lesson, by the way. So you remember the Supercell, this class of clans game uh, they had. That's the game that, you know, made a $10 billion difference in their market valuation. That game was their game number 34. Okay, that means, <laughs> that means that, you know, to be successful as an entrepreneur, these guys, they tried and failed 33 times. Okay, they try and fail 33 times and then they hit on the jackpot. So this is what I mean with experimentation and this is what you are doing. Now, obviously, in the case of the supercell, you need to start asking, you know, where do you cross the border between persistence and stupidity? Because there has to be somewhere, but they, were, they certainly were persistent. Um, connected to the question related to regional entrepreneurial ecosystem, Alejandro, uh, since you founded together with your three co-founders uh, the company here in Barranquilla, what do you feel that you have as an advantage here in Barranquilla and what do you feel that is your disadvantage of being here? Okay, this is a hard question. I think that an advantage is that all the partners before we are from Barranquilla. So new, we knew the Barranquilla's people. <laughs> we are not similar, as, uh, you know, the people from Bogota is, has another culture, is the cultural system. So it was an advantage and it was random. We chose Barranquilla because we grew up here in Barranquilla and this advantage it's the same. It's the cultural, you know, the, col the, the cultural shock that we 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 establish sometimes. But Barranquilla is developing a lot. What we there are some. If if you went abroad or to another city 20 years ago and you come back, you will see another city. So the development that we have seen in this city. Uh, is in all the industry and in all the segments and all the spaces. So that's an advantage. Great, thank you. There's a question from the public. Yes, uh, hello everybody. My name is Juan Jose Calderon. I'm studying industrial engineer. Uh, first of all, I have two questions. The first one could be answered by Mr. Erko. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it will be, you talk about uh, the competition and here in Colombia, we have strategies called red ocean and blue ocean. It means about the strategies that, I don't know, companies share their information or they don't. And you know that in Colombia and around the world, there are some selfishness uh, with the people that they, want to, they don't want to share their abilities because of course, every company depends on money. And in many occasions for people is the most important thing. But I like what you say. Uh, what you say about uh, that is important always, always to share that information to improve the 
the market. So I don't know with the strategies or with which idea you could think that the business or I don't know, uh, the companies could change that way to see the things. I don't know, to churn other things, to uh, not always pay attention to money. Perhaps that they could uh, be more, put more attention for the company and also to improve not only them, because we all can improve. So that will be my first question and then the, the other to Alejandro. Yeah, so I, I think what you are talking about there is, and again, it goes back to, you know, what our entrepreneurial ecosystem is about and, um, you know, when can you trust people and what are the ideas that you can actually share? So um, remember, if you are in a furniture cluster, you are in a furniture business, then you are less likely to want to share your secrets with others because they will just copy them and, you know, then they will make the furniture and sell it and, you know, your business suffers and they, um, they, um, and they make more money. So, you know, what kind of knowledge are we talking about? And, and this is why it's important to understand that when you have an entrepreneurial ecosystem, it's really all about, it's not product innovation, it's business model innovation. You have an idea, you, you, you have a problem and then you try these different ways, you know, what kind of revenue model should I have? How, how, you know, how do I market this idea digitally, what have you? Uh, in, because in an entrepreneurial ecosystem, it is the entrepreneur who bring their sector's uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, there's less likely that I'm competing with him, but I'm trying to do, you know, I'm trying to apply these digital advances and figure out, well, how do I do this digitally? And there's natural trust because now we don't compete. Mm -hmm. So now we can trust one another and there's this reciprocity. I, I, I know that I share with Alejandro, then Alejandro, next time I have a problem, you know, he will be happy to make suggestions towards me because we don't compete with one another, but we compete each with the same we, means with, you know, whoever incumbent we choose to challenge in whichever sector. Um, so, you know, that's the trust bit because Alejandro, if my background is say in uh, insurance business, Alejandro doesn't know anything about insurance or maybe, maybe you do, but you know, just to make <laughs> exactly. an example, I don't know anything about factoring. So there's, you know, it's not likely that I, I'm going to copy his idea. And, but on the other hand, if I share, you know, what, what did I learn about this digital platform or that? then he is likely to give me valuable tips later. So in that sense, you know, this whole trust issue is much smaller um, in, in an entrepreneurial ecosystem situation. Okay, uh, me. I, I, yeah. I, I think that you gotta make the example. You gotta create the, the, the ecosystem. You gotta be, you gotta have an excellent relationship with the competitors, not, not the competitors, the competitors, uh, as Mr. Erko says, <laughs> you, you got to choose what you can exchange the information you got. I'm not going to give the Coca-Cola recipe. <laughs> I'm going to change. We're going to exchange some information to help each other and to develop together, but not, not your secret, but you got to be near, you got to create it. And the, the only the, the only thing that I that from my perspective you can make is to give the example like a father to a child. <laughs> no. That's okay, perfect. And the other question is going to be about you know first of all when you want to make a, a new business you have to establish something. So for example, I'm gonna give a product or give a service, but uh, after COVID uh, all the pandemic. It was a great example that also Mr. Erko said that that digitally was an improvement and also a help for those in business that, I don't know, for example, Netflix, yeah. it, it takes a great improvement in, in all the houses as many other business. So I don't know if, if by your own experience you recommend, for example, when I'm, if I start a business, 
first of all, by establishing if it's going to be a product or a service, I should also establish that it will be a product that could work not only in, I don't know, stores or I'm going to sell it, that it could be also a bit moved by digitally, you know, that have a, a not only a certain idea to have multiple choices. Yeah. Could be a great example of like Mr. Erko said, and I think that digitally nowadays is something important and it could be a step up in our business or in our personal life. So I don't know what is your opinion on, about it. Yes, I think that from the start, you don't know everything that was is going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we started, but we start with something that is the problem. You mm -hmm. obsess with the problem and you solve it. And the way you solve it, you got multiple choices. And also when you are solving it, you find other problems and you solve them uh, again. So uh, at the beginning, you don't know everything. You don't know everything, the scope or what you are going to attack or you are going to, to solve, but you start. Uh, you gotta make a, I don't know, a business plan. Mm -hmm. You gotta uh, take the funding and you gotta start it. Then, but with the problem, very, very, very identified. That's it. Yeah, I, I would add to that, that, you know, there's this wisdom um, that comes from um, military that, you know, no battle plan ever survives the first contact with the enemy. Mm -hmm. So whatever you are planning, when you first try it, you will find that this doesn't work and then you need to try something else. So that means that, um, and this is why, you know, in the lean entrepreneurship heuristic, you have this notion of minimum viable product. So you might have a solution, but be prepared that that solution is not going to be your final solution. It never will. So don't bet your house <laughs> on developing that first product. Try it. Just try something quick and dirty. Create a mock-up web page or something. See if people start clicking to, you know, offer your service. Mm -hmm. If they don't click, you didn't lose much, but now you might get some feedback that gives you an idea that perhaps this thing might work. So this experimentation is so important that you need to make sure that you do that cheaply. And then eventually you will hit on a formula that works. Yeah. Thank you very much. So there's another question here from the public. Um, I have a question about the control measure, uh, how you have a control measure of security in the company to avoid the, uh, some, tre some threats like hackers, for example. I take uh, an example, the company Supercell that have, uh, in my opinion, one of the best system of security or, or a very strong security system to avoid the hackers in their games. The question is uh, for, 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 for you, Alejandro. Yeah, for Alejandro, yes. <laughs> yes, the IT, the IT team. We have an IT team that a hey, every day we get attacks. It's incredible. There are so many people that every day is developing ways to attack you. So what you should have is a good IT uh, uh, team that is preventing. To, to those to those attacks and this is like the 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 risks from the uh, the attack of the hackers for example but there are some other risks for example there is called um something that used to to be in the market that is called the gemeleo gemeleo is when you have an invoice and you go to a factoring company and you ask for the payment and then with the same invoice, you go to another one. Uh, you ask for the same payment of the same invoice, two payments. So what we did is that we, uh, there is one database uh, of the government where we can consult if the invoice is already uh, discounted or not. So. You gotta make operations. You gotta protect yourself every time. Okay. Is there processes? Oh. Okay. Alejandro, I have a question that just um, popped into my mind after what you mentioned of the Gemeleo. 
Oh, yeah. And it is, do you think that you would have been able to set up your company if the facturación electrónica had not taken place? I don't know yet because the facturación electrónica was already. But I think that in another way, I will have tried to solve it in another way because with the facturación electrónica, the factura is already in the in the system. So I can consult it. Then I will have developed another process to, to, to check it. I don't know yet, but I think that I would have tried because I start working in the factoring industry before the factura electronica. When we endorse the factura with the signature be in, in the on the side, yeah. So, which goes back to what Erko said uh, about the infrastructure, the institutional conditions uh, that heavily influence the way that you do your business, right? Um, is there any other question from the public for the moment? Because then I have. Last one, and with that, we would finish for today. Um, you have talked about inclusion. Uh, you have talked about uh, the variety of uh, entrepreneurship. How can an entrepreneurial ecosystem support this whole variety of entrepreneurship and not just focus, for example, on the high-tech startups or not just focus on the small businesses that sell the fruits in the corner? How can you do that with them needing so different things and being so different things well my my answer to that would be that um obviously the the most important thing to recognize that we have different kinds of entrepreneurship okay so we have digital entrepreneurship we have physical entrepreneurship maybe we want to make and sell products and that's why we want to you know grow agricultural produce and sell that and that's why fine uh, but they are different and they face different challenges um, if you want to scale a grow a physical business you will need cash because you will need to build your machinery or what have you and that means that you need to invest money before you can make money so that's expensive in a digital business what you need to do find an, find a problem and then you know start trying out with different solutions but do it cheaply you don't need to do much planning or you know you don't need much cash just you know start iterating and you will find something eventually so these are different heuristics and they need different support systems and this is why one support system probably cannot support all kinds of entrepreneurship so entrepreneurial ecosystems these are networks of individuals essentially who are willing to share good ideas with one another and support one another and when they experiment and try to solve problems for physical business you know maybe you need uh, loan guarantees or uh, investment schemes or things like that and th therefore there maybe you need to support these clusters and you know that's a different kind of system all these different types of entrepreneurship are important, but they require different kinds of support. I, I think that you got to choose. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we know that there are so many kinds of entrepreneurship, but you don't know where they, when the idea comes. Maybe you have two drinks on you and the idea came. <laughs> That's it. And you got to develop this idea. You got to choose how do you solve this idea that comes with a problem solution and you gotta choose you gotta choose where where do you wanna act that's it well thank you very much erko thank you very much alejandro uh, thank you to all of you for being here today and um thanks to catedra europa have thank a good you. day Explora más contenidos de tu interés. No olvides suscribirte a nuestro canal.